Welcome to ADHD is over, a new podcast on a seemingly old label that we're going to be peeling off. Join my wife, Tatiana, and I as we journey with our family, the Wyden family, through the land of confusing information. We're going to visit both sides and let you decide because the power is with you. Welcome to ADHD is over. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. It is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful rainy day here in Southern California. And I hope this episode finds you doing well in life, wherever you're at, in one of the many countries that I see are listening in, listening to our podcast, ADHD is over. There's been a lot of interest recently from uh, parents, but also from some of the experts or professionals I've talked to about trauma. There's been interest in trauma and, or at least I should say, there's been interest in the discussion around trauma. We certainly don't want to repeat traumas or trigger them unnecessarily, right? But I thought of gathering uh, some of my notes that I've collected over the years. And so if you Uh, hear me flipping through the pages. I have a very small, cute um, little notebook where I keep uh, ADHD-related thoughts, ideas for podcast episodes and so on. So I will flip through some of them and also refer to things other experts have said. So I want to start off uh, by saying to anyone listening that we cannot trauma-proof a human being. As a parent, we do operate as if we should, or it's not so much could, but we do operate as if we should trauma-proof our child as much as possible. We may not say it that way. We may not use those words. We may just say, well, I want to make sure my child is safe or my child makes as few mistakes as possible, falls on their faces as you know little as possible and so forth, right? We may not even use language, but we are driven to protect our children, of course. It's innate. But I just wanted to say that no matter what we do as parents, we can never trauma-proof a child. We can't. How come? Well, first of all, Trauma is the needed contrast for us humans to learn from, to grow from, to expand, to rise from the ashes. I can certainly relate to in my life currently. um, There's been a lot of wrestling with old patterns. A lot of healing is going on and there are many days when I just want to give everything up. When I ask myself, why am I even doing this life, this movement, this podcast, this everything? There's been many days, call them some dark nights of the soul. But moving through those traumatic spaces, those triggers, right? Those patterns, those feelings that just want to be expressed, need to be expressed, need to finally be felt. They need to be, there's a saying and I'm going to butcher it, but we need to feel to heal. And a lot of us as children, we've suppressed emotions. And those emotions are stuck energetically in our bodies. And even if our bodies are fairly healthy, fairly flexible, we're doing well in life, we think, right? Those emotions at some point in our lives are begging to be felt. So we need to feel to heal. So I've had a lot of feelings come up, sadness, anger. We can categorize them as negative feelings, if you'd like, negative energy, I don't see it as negative as in not good. I don't want them. Yes, I feel that way sometimes. I'm like, oh, I got to sit with another day of, you know, sadness or just 
feeling worthless or wanting to give up or angry or irritated or bored. But all of those feelings are coming up to be felt. The reason why I'm mentioning this and I'm using myself as, as an example is because of what I was just sharing. That those feelings have been suppressed all these years of my life because of traumatic events. And traumatic doesn't always have to be dramatic. You've heard me say this before if you've been listening to other episodes that just because there's no drama doesn't mean there's no trauma. So things happen throughout our childhood. They start even in vitro, in the belly, as, as little beans, little babies, or at birth, during birth, right? Complications. There's many things that happen that are very traumatic to a new soul born into a new body, a new human being that arrives on this planet. There are many things, many, that impact a nervous system as such a fragile, brand new nervous system. And yet, we don't think about that. We go, well, you know, this child grew up like that child. Why does this child act crazy and this one doesn't, right? We don't ever consider that, first of all, we're all individuals, unique, and we all have things happening. So back to trauma, right? We all have things happening in our childhood. And it's inevitable. Things do happen that stress our nervous systems. We're built that way, but we're also built to cope with it. And not always cope, but later to be able to heal from these traumatic events. We have the innate human capability of healing ourselves, not just physically from a you know paper cut to wound, to internal, to many, you know, things that we come across during our lifetimes, many events, many um, accidents, many uh, challenges that we can heal ourselves. I do believe that. And so that is trauma. We can't trauma-proof anyone. Therefore, the question to ask is not how can I avoid, you know, having my child experience trauma. It's more like how can we as parents... How can we be there and assist our children in processing and healing those moments as they happen? So later on, like in my case at 53 years old, I don't have to then, you know, spend years and years and years of processing and healing and, and therapy and so forth. And trust me, I'm, I'll do the work. I'm doing the work. I'm, I'll gladly do the work because here I am at this place in my life today with all the experiences I've had in my life and I continue to show up to be a more aware, a more present, a more authentic person. Now, it's not easy, very hard for a recovering people pleaser like myself. And trust me, I've had my share of experiences, especially over the last two, two and a half years I've been going through a lot and I, I'm not going to go into detail, but everything I've experienced during the last two and a half years has been so impactful, so challenging, yet so powerful, so insightful, and is such a gift every moment during the last two and a half years. Every human being that I've come into contact with, that I've shared either uh, a relationship with or a project or that I've just met for a day or talked for one conversation somewhere, every event and every person truly has been a gift. Because today, I look at myself and there are parts of me that I don't rec recognize anymore because I've left behind old patterns. And it's hard work. It's really hard work. And the reason why I mention that is because every generation, I believe, grows up to be a little more aware and perhaps a little more committed to putting together, to piecing together the puzzle that will give us insights into all the patterns that 
transgenerational patterns of our own families, right? Our parents and grandparents and so forth. So that we can grow more aware. We can be more present. We can be more loving. We can be more in peace, right? It's what everybody wants, love and peace. Well, some may say, I don't want that. But ultimately, I do believe every human being, when in the presence of love and peace, and I believe how we get there is truth. That's a whole nother episode. Every human being in the presence of love, peace, and truth will feel the serenity that we're all after in life. And so, why am I mentioning that? Because it is my commitment that my two boys, now 11 and 14, do not have to wait until they're 53 years old to finally wake up and so clearly see their patterns, their past patterns of behaviors that do not work anymore. I really hope that they can see that by the time they're 25, 30. I don't know. It doesn't matter what the number is. But my commitment is to stand on the shoulders of giants, just like they're going to stand on my shoulders and someone else is going to stand on their shoulders, right? That is a contribution that I'm committed to making. Hence this entire podcast. ADHD is over is not a movement simply to just say, oh, let's just make away with the label and the medication as the only solution, right? Or as the main solution. That's not why. Underlying, again, going back to trauma is really a commitment to invite all of us, including myself, you know, it's a lifelong journey, to invite all of us to realize trauma is part of our, our machinery, our operating system as humans. It is actually a gift. It is here to allow us to become stronger and bigger and more aware in the presence of them, right? One of my former uh, podcast guests, Bedros Killian, who uh, is the founder of Squire. It's a boot camp that I took, a uh, father-son boot camp I took with Kai, my son, who's 14 this year. And it was amazing, so impactful, highly recommended to all the fathers and sons out there. He says, iron forges iron. What that means in my language is trauma forges a stronger person if trauma isn't approached with a victimhood mentality. But rather, when some event comes into our lives, whether it's past as a young child or as an adult, if we can eventually, in the case of a child, when we mature, when we're mature enough to realize what happened, if we can go through processing, as in planning to eventually accept and forgive, and then use trauma as a gift my one of my favorite sayings is your mess is your message right if we can take those messes those traumatic messes and realize oh they're in my life for a reason and not as in like you know i don't know what you believe in but it's not so much a a reason like a god-given reason or faith or any of that yes i do believe in that but you don't have to but my point here is it's in your life for a reason, even if that reason is simply it's here, it's in your life right now. So we have two choices, accept, transform, forgive and empower and move forward or stay in the victim mentality of like, poor me. Now, which one of those two do you think gives you more power, right? I'll let you answer that. So we have that choice with every traumatic event. Hence, we cannot trauma prove a child. We cannot trauma-proof ourselves, right? Human beings. So then if we can't trauma-proof anyone, then the question, the real question is, what can we do? What kind of tools can we collect, right? And what kind of uh, modalities can we use? What kind of strategies do we have available to us to transform those traumas into growing growth opportunities, right? So just want to talk quickly about a saying I wrote down a while back, and I don't remember who said it, but it really doesn't matter at this point. Trauma is the separation from self, disassociation. What does that mean? Well, 
in simple terms, a traumatic event happens. And as a child, it is not comfortable when it happens. So what we do is we make it about ourselves. I'm bad or I did something wrong or the world doesn't like me, God doesn't like me, or I'm unlucky, or whatever the thought process is, right, can lead to a disassociation, a separation from self. Because if we believe I'm bad, or I'm lucky, the world doesn't like me, God doesn't, you know, make, made me broken, whatever that is, or I'm punished for something, bad karma, you fill in the blank. The first step is to go, how can I not be here? And how can I not be me? Well, that's called checking out. This association is checking out. We almost disembody, right? We're not in our bodies. We're not in ourselves. We're not mentally present. And you see how that's starting to kind of border on ADHD behavior. To be checking out, to not be present, to not be here, to look for something that feels good. That's a coping mechanism, right? See how that's bordering on addictions, right? To look for the shiny thing because that looks more fun. That takes me out of the gloomy moment here, whether it's in the moment of the trauma happening or whether it's later when a trauma experience, you know, when we get triggered and it comes back to us and we just need to, quote unquote, numb out, disassociate, cope with the stress of the moment. I always say the key word around trauma and ADHD is feeling unsafe. You could add feeling unloved, but when we feel unsafe, we naturally want to be in a place, whether it's physical or emotional, psychological, that is safe. Now you could substitute the word safe for fun because when we're bored, when it's gloomy, when it's dark, when it's heavy, I need something fun. I need a drink. I need to binge watch Netflix. I need to uh, go gamble. I need to have sex, whatever, right? All of those things, those things, those behaviors that then become a coping mechanism then can become addictions because our brain gets dopamine hits from those escapes, if you will, from eating, from uh, watching Netflix, from having sex, from going to the office for four more hours, from gambling, all those, all those activities cause the brain to get these dopamine spikes. And that's the beginning of addiction. And look, I'm not an expert, so there's probably words I say or things I uh, talk about here that are not a, a thousand percent accurate. But I am pretty confident that I'm accurate in the reactions and in the behaviors that follow because I've talked to so many experts, top experts, and I'm piecing this together for myself. So let's talk a little bit more about this disassociation. So there's a thing called the ego, or, you know, let's just say the mind in those moments, right? The mind is the one that's like, whoa, 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 not feeling safe here. Let's check out. Let's numb. Don't want to be here. Let's find something more comfortable, right? The ego needs to keep itself alive and, I guess, happy or entertained versus sad and bored, right? So the strategy is distraction, right? So the ego needs you to have no focus on a purpose or on solving this. Because first of all, if you're little, if you're a small child dealing with a, a traumatic event, you just don't want to be there. It's just not comfortable. It's as simple as that, right? And so um, when we look at the ego, right? In that moment, it seeks distraction, it really needs something else other than the uncomfortable current moment. So we numb out, we check out, and that's how this association, this association happens, right? So I want to flip to another page here. I made a note, and this was uh, Joe Dispenza uh, talking, and I'm, uh, it's, it's probably paraphrasing it, but the goal to disrupt this kind of... Um, let's just call it a genetic reaction because, you know, I often hear people say, well, ADHD is genetic. And I've done uh, podcast episodes on this and you can look this up. Um, it's not uh, genetic. That, that is actually the wrong uh, statement. It's epigenetic. And when you look that up, um, epigenetics clearly has proven 
since the 80s already, including uh, biologists like Bruce Lipton speaks on this and other biologists, that um, the environment, meaning the external world, has the power to turn on and off our own genes. Now we have to remember, we, the human being in this life, in this life form, in this body, we are part of the environment. So here's what Joe Dispenza says. He says, we need to signal to our genes, meaning turning them on or off, we, right? We have the power to. We need to signal to our genes from inside before the environment can signal to the genes from outside. Let me read that one more time. We need to signal to our genes to turn them on or off from inside before the environment can signal to the genes from outside. What does that mean? Well, it means when we, you know, when we allow ourselves to be run, to be dictated by external sources, and when I say environment, anything can be in the environment, right? It can be uh, pollution, it can be uh, unaware parenting, it can be uh, a community that's uh, so into their culture that they literally disregard um, simple human basic uh, needs, right? I don't want to get too, too much into this, but we can look around the world where there's war. We can identify certain cultures that are just like, nope, we are not going to do this peacefully, right? Those are all extreme forces in the environment that have an effect on our nervous system that rewire our brains and that ultimately have the power to turn off or on a gene. And just a side note, there is no ADHD gene. Never has been proven. Now, some of our experts talk like there is. They say it's genetic. Don't believe them. There's some truth to it. It's not the full truth. Do more research on epigenetics if you still believe that ADHD is genetic. By the way, alcoholism is also not genetic. But those are all what we call disorders, quote unquote, that are influenced by the environment, meaning external. But the real personal work, and I'm learning this myself personally, currently going through a lot of healing, a lot of transformation, I'm learning that I have the power to actually from within change the patterns that so many people think, oh, it's transgenerational. Oh, it's in your family. It's genes and oh, it's just how it is. You know, whatever the story is that you tell yourself, that your parents have told yourself or, or society tells you, we, in contrary, we have the power to rewire our own brain. We have the power to regulate our own nervous system after a traumatic event. Now, not as a five-year-old, right? That's where parents come in. But parents have the power to co-regulate with their children after a traumatic event. And parents, let me tell you something. Every event can have the potential to be traumatic. We've been sold a bucket of bullshit when it comes to parenting. We've been told that, oh, if your baby cries in the crib, you just got to let it cry. Don't go hold it because then it's going to learn that every time it cries that you arrive and that you're going to hold it. Bullshit. As a certified parenting coach, I can tell you that there's a bucket of bullshit we've been served as parents. That when children cry, when children need their parents, need love, that is a moment for us to give it to them. What does it look like? I'm going to use an example. I was at Starbucks recently. My boys wanted to stop there on a, on a trip to LA. And um, we went, I went inside because I had to use the bathroom. Parked outside, my boys hung out, I went inside, and as I was waiting in line, there was a little boy crying on one of the, the, the benches by a table, and the mom was standing right next to it, and the boy was just crying, but wasn't one of those like throwing a fit, uh, you know, uh, as they call it, the terrible twos, which I think is a horrible term because it just says, well, they're just all terrible at that age, so you just let them cry. That's a whole other story, but... This young boy was crying. I could tell he was in distress. And I was standing there and I felt it so strongly that that child right now needs an embrace from at least one of the parents. But I really felt that child needs the mother because the mother was standing right there. And there was such a cold reaction 
to the child that I almost felt no different, almost like I am not, I'm a stranger, I'm not the parent, so I'm not going to jump in there. But she had a similar energy as in like, well, it's my child crying and I just, I just got to let him cry, you know. And I, in that moment, I saw so much of our parenting is so conditioned by the bucket of bullshit that I just mentioned that we don't show up for our children in that moment. And it doesn't have anything to do with love because you might be irritated in that moment and embarrassed, but you step in and you provide that nurture, right? That warmth, that feeling of safety for your child right there. That's all they want. Now, if we don't do it, that could be a traumatic event. That could be uh, evidence that this child collects subconsciously that with my parents or my mom, I'm not safe. And perhaps even in public, I'm not safe. Around other people, I'm not safe. On a wooden bench, I'm not safe. Laying down on a bench, I'm not safe. Whatever, there's so many ways this event could be looked at. So many perspectives and all of them go into this this, uh, folder in the child's subconscious around feeling unsafe. And those are tiny little trickle traumatic events that build up over time. So trauma doesn't always have to be the one, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, divorce, whatever, you know, horrible birth. That's, it's not the same for every child. So why am I mentioning this? Why am I going into this detail? Because it's important for us to know that there's, that every moment is an opportunity for us to be there, to show up for our children and to make them feel safe. Trust me, there are enough events in a child's life already at an early age that will make them feel unsafe. So if we can at least reduce the amount of uh, trauma, hey, we win, right? Again, can't trauma proof it, but we can certainly reduce it. So I just want to go to a diagram now that uh, on you can't see it because it's a podcast, but I'll fill you in as much as I can. This is a, di- a diagram that I was given by Dr. Peter Levine, a specialist when it comes to trauma. He created a system, Somatic Experiencing. Um, if you're not familiar with it, look it up. Uh, Peter Levine is a wonderful man, and we were interviewing him for our documentary. And he handed me this Venn diagram, and he said, have you seen this before? And I hadn't. And it was the overlap between trauma and ADHD. And the overlap, meaning the things that trauma and ADHD have in common, really opened my eyes. I'm going to read them for you. Again, remember, this is, these are not symptoms of ADHD. These are not symptoms of trauma. These are actually symptoms and overlap symptoms for both. First one, restless. Second one, hyperactive. Third one, easily distracted. Fourth one, difficulty concentrating. Fifth one, hard time listening. Sixth one, difficulty sleeping. Seven, disorganized. One could think that those are the symptoms of ADHD. Turns out those are symptoms of trauma. Well, which one is it? Does it really matter? Well, I think it matters because... I think it's time that we wake up and realize that disorders that we call, for example, ADHD, are not truly disorders the way we, you know, the meaning we give it in society. What do I mean by that? Well, a disorder is a um, disempowering label. Now, I know there's some of you going like, well, what's the problem with a label? Labels are great. You know, medical professionals can write it. Now, once I found out I had ADHD and I knew it was wrong with it, the labels are, don't, Roman, don't. Don't say that. Why do you always say that? Well, I give the same example every time. If you're out on the street and there was a man on the street, you know, with a microphone asking people, um, hey, would you ever want to date somebody with a disorder? Most likely, most people would, even if they're saying, "Eh, okay, yes, because they want to sound nice. The internal reaction is, "Mm, I don't think so. Why? A disorder isn't necessarily an empowering good thing. 
right? The agreement, the point I'm trying to make here, the agreement in our society, what the word disorder means or brings up is negative. Negative simply meaning disempowering. I want to make sure I'm not a positive, negative, good, bad kind of person in terms of labels. But when something is disempowering, to me, that's negative energy. So a label like ADHD, meaning to call it a disorder, is a disempowering label. So back to trauma and ADHD overlapping. Why do I think it's important for us to realize that maybe we're not seeing this correctly? That maybe we have labeled or created all these disorders in the DSM that actually are results that stem from trauma in our lives and we then feel the need to label them as disorders and quickly go, oh, something's wrong with my brain. Not that person over there, that person's normal, but my brain, something's wrong with it. But let me cover it up by saying it's a superpower. Still, I feel like something's off with me, but I'll just, you know, put on a cape and it's my superpower. To me, that's all something that that's all phony still. Because if we're not acknowledging deep down that what if we have it backwards? What if traumatic events in our lives that we don't process and heal become these quote unquote disorders? Why? How? Well, we start behaving like somebody who has unhealed trauma and then that gets labeled as a symptom and then that fits into the description, the bucket of this disorder called ADHD, right? I know it's a lot to follow, but it's the crux here. Like we need to start, we need to wake up and realize if, for example, if our trauma experts see this overlap between trauma and ADHD, and it's so clear that it's not a freestanding disorder like a broken brain or you have this thing. People always say, I have ADHD. I'm the first to say, no, you don't. Nobody can actually have it. You behave at times in a way that people may call a disorder, ADHD, right? The symptoms. But that's behavior. It is observed behaviors. You cannot have observed behaviors. It's not a thing you have. It's a way of being. And where does it come from? Why are you being that way? Why are you behaving that way? And it all points back to trauma. I've interviewed hundreds of experts by now. It all seems to point back to trauma. It all seems to point back to the environment that we grow up in, right? Shapes our brain wiring. It affects our nervous system. And those two, and this is in layman's terms, affect our behavior. And then our behavior gets labeled, oh, these are the symptoms of this disorder. Whatever the disorder, you can fill in the blank. It doesn't have to be just ADHD. You could talk about depression. You could talk about OCD. All of those things are direct result of unhealed, unprocessed trauma. And I wanted to do an episode around it because I'm so deep in trauma healing myself right now. I'm so deep in uh, leaving behind, you know, transforming, leaving behind these old patterns that had me behave a certain way in life. They created a persona of the people pleaser, a persona of the addict around sex and love, a persona that when people say, oh, you're in your own way, and I never understood this saying, I never understood what that meant. I mean, I kind of got it. I was like, yeah, yeah, don't be in my own way. God, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, do it. I was like, how the fuck do I do that? What do I do? Well, now I get it. What that means is when I can remove that persona that I've created in these 53 years as a direct result of trying to cope with my childhood traumas, if I can remove that persona of the people pleaser, the liar, the cheater, the, 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 the addict, if I can remove that, now I, the real me, can shine through. And as parents with our children, we can do the same thing. Instead of giving them a pill or labeling them as, well, they're just, you know, different learning difficulty and, you know, superpowers. And, you know, instead of hiding behind that, we can step up and say, hey, 
What needs to be processed and healed here? How can I as a parent support my child? Well, I'm going to give you the answer now because I've done seven years of research and I'm pretty clear if somebody showed up at my door right now with a gun and said, hey, Roman, tell me the one thing, the one thing, you have to tell me just one thing that is what you think the solution. Remember, I said what I think, right? It's not the truth. If that, I, here's what I would say at gunpoint, I would say, okay, fine. Here, here it is. You, the parent, process and heal your own traumas. Your child will co-regulate and heal with you. It is similar in relationships, by the way, and this is getting maybe too far out there. I'll make it quick. When two people meet and fall in love, and often it can be a trauma bond, when that happens and these two people separate, I do believe even if they're not physically together, when one starts healing, the other heals and vice versa. I do believe when we regulate, co-regulate, when our energies are together in, this, in the same energetic field with a person, whether it's a lover, whether it's a child, when one person goes first and starts the healing, the other one heals as well. So if as a parent, you take on your healing, you commit yourself to breaking through in your own life, to, to looking at all the areas of your own life that are not working as well as you'd like it to. And you have to be honest about that. You know, uh, I often say like, you know, take inventory from a scale from one to 10. How satisfied are you with your with your physical appearance, with your health and wellness, with your finances, with your relationship, right? Marriage, whatever, with your parenting, spiritual, whatever. Really take inventory. And when you're brutally honest, and there are many areas that are a four and a five instead of an eight or a nine, it's time to ask the tough questions. What am I avoiding? You know, what are my coping, coping mechanisms? When do I check out? What do I check out with? Do I feel better or worse after I check out with X, Y, Z, right? Am I maybe a bit like ignorant when it comes to my marriage or am I just like, yeah, you know, um, there's a word for it. It's not coming to me, but resigned, right? Am I like, yeah, it's as good as it can be. That's where we got to cut the bullshit. As good as it can be? What kind of answer is that, right? So that's how honest we have to get as parents. I'm a big believer I will most likely believe this. I'm open that it could change, but I feel it so strongly. I most likely will believe this until the day I die. That if as parents, we go first, we do the tough work, the healing. Healing work is the hardest work I've ever done in my life. Harder than construction. I've worked construction, waiting tables. Harder than phys physical labor in the middle of August, outside gardening, like you name it, I've seen not all of it, but some really hard work that that's nothing compared to the real trauma healing work. It is intense. It is emotionally, physically, spiritually. It is so intense at times that I just want to give up, but I'm not going to give up. I'm just not. I've committed to doing this work. And when it comes down to describing why is it so hard, Somebody asked me the other day, what do you mean it's hard? I said to my friend, the hardest thing is when you're sitting with, say, boredom, discomfort, sadness, confusion, lostness, whatever you're sitting with. Like when I'm sitting there and it's so strong, like the other day I had a day of sadness. I was looking back at my last relationship and... It was so unbearably sad to see my patterns that came out in that relationship and to see that that relationship in its current iteration cannot work and that it had to stop. When I had to sit with that sadness, there's many days I sit with it, but that one day was so heavy. I felt like I can't escape. It's like feeling with, you know, your back up against the wall and somebody's just looking at you saying, be sad, 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 sad. And you just can't go in. You just can't move. You can't go. You can't escape. You can't, you know. Until I realized, oh, I'm resisting to feel the sadness. 
I wasn't even feeling it yet. It was just in my head still of like, oh, I'm so sad and oh, this didn't work out, at least for now. And oh, just, ugh. I what, what what can I do? I can, can I go back and change it? Can, like, can I, should I reach out? No, it, I, it was just so, I was so in my head, not allowing myself to feel the feels. And the moment I allowed it and I said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm sad. I'm going to be sad. And if I cry, I cry. If I'm a mess, I'm a mess. If I need to lay down, I'm going to lay down. If I need to go for a while, whatever, right? And I allowed myself to break down. And I think I cried for what seemed like five minutes with snot and all. And after that, I cannot tell you how beautiful the moment was when I owned the sadness, when I owned who I had been, what has happened, what I've done. And when I saw the entire, entire event as a gift to me to be able to release that emotion of sadness. Why am I telling the story? Well, again, going back to trauma that we often relive is due to emotions, feelings that are stuck in the body that have been suppressed, right? That we need to feel to heal. And it's hard work because we often refuse to feel it and we, we, we literally resist. The resisting part is the hardest thing. Being in our heads about it makes it so much harder. So yes, it's hard work, but I'm here to say that unless we, in this case, if you're a parent with a child with ADHD, unless you as a parent start doing that work, start facing all those uncomfortable moments, those uncomfortable feelings, those things that we've been running from. And that's why I always, you know, connect ADHD to addiction. Because biologically, they're based similarly. The coping mechanism, Gabor Mate talks about that. Other um, addiction experts have now met, are starting to mention it. It's not, not to say ADHD is an addiction, but it kind of is. Because the shiny new object that continues to distract us is just another coping mechanism. It's an escape to not be in the present moment because the present moment is either uncomfortable or reminds us of a moment that was uncomfortable that was the same, similar, right? So we have a coping mechanism. We need to check out of the current uncomfortable, unsafe moment and the shiny new thing over there or the squirrel on a tree or whatever it is or the... the um, parachuting out of an airplane or the, you know, the, the thrill that we're looking for in sex, drugs, and rock and roll and overeating and, and binge watching television and workaholism and so forth, right? All of that, those are addictions. And ADHD in a way is no different. And it's not to make it wrong. If you have ADHD and you're like, well, fuck you for saying ADHD is an I'm not an addict. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is that even addicts, for example, addicts aren't addicts because they're born addicts. Addicts are addicts because they had traumatic events in their lives that they haven't processed and healed, that they've been running from, trying to get away. People have, myself, I've been running for 53 years, trying to get away or stay away from uncomfortable emotions, feelings that I did not want to experience, that I did not want to feel as a child all the way up until now. Well, <laughs> about nine months ago, I realized that I have to stop running. And the work that I've been doing personally is so related to my work around ADHD and trauma. And all this, you know, this movement, this podcast now makes sense to me why I was attracted why it showed up in my field, in my life, for me to take this on. I'm not an ADHD activist. You know, this isn't like, oh, the only thing I'll ever do. But I'm so committed to healing the traumas in my life that that's going to affect my children, my immediate family, my community, and so forth. It ripples out, right? Like Gandhi always says, be the change that you wish to see in the world. Well, 
I always say that you've heard me say this world peace is not attainable if we go look for it outside of us. If we try to make others wrong, the Republicans are wrong or the Israelis are wrong or the these people are wrong. And if this only changed and if that and why are these people so stingy and there's not enough food and world peace will never happen from the outside in. It is from the inside out. That is not just my belief. Gandhi said it. But that is, the, that is my belief, that the only work there really is to do is the inner healing work. Real work, like jobs, we call it business, busyness, that's how it's spelled, right? Busyness is actually there distracting us from the real work. I believe that the real work, and I'm relating this back to the parents doing the work first, that will co-regulate their children, that, that symptoms, like the symptoms of ADHD or other disorders, as we call them, will disappear over time. How do I know this? Well, first of all, neuroplasticity, the brain can rewire itself. Scientifically proven, no one can argue that. Yet we ignore it. What do I mean by that? Well, these disorders, these symptoms can disappear. In contrary to what we hear from mainstream experts saying, well, you have this for life and you got to take meds for life and you just got to manage it and you just, that's who you are. That's your persona. You just have this thing. Bullshit. Let me say it one more time. Bullshit. Neuroplasticity is the best proof that first of all, our brain can be rewired. If our brain can be rewired from the inside out, meaning we are in charge of rewiring it, not some medication that temporarily changes our neurochemical balance and then call it a neurochemical imbalance and then sort of tries to mess with our chemicals in the brain and because we don't have enough data and long-standing uh, scientific research, we are actually playing Russian roulette. I'm not going to go into that detail. But what I want to say here is that if we can rewire our brain, we can be in charge of doing that ourselves with the help of therapy and support groups and so forth, right? It is totally possible. So as a parent, if you rewire your brain first, and trust me, if you have a child with so-called ADHD in your life, that is a check engine light. That child is simply pointing out that in the environment called your family, there are things out of whack that the nervous system of that child is begging for you as a parent to heal, process and heal those whacks, those bumps, to start doing the real work. Do you love your job? Are you actually in a career that's good for your nervous system or not? Are you there because you love it or are you after the money? Are you there because of the fame? Are you there because of the, the uh, admiration? Are you there because it's a title? It sounds good. Are you there because your neighbors think you're awesome because you have this high-powered job, right? Are you in the right marriage, relationships? Are you with somebody because it's comfortable? Are you uh, so um, enmeshed and codependent that it's just like it's, it is what it is? Is it traditional that it was an arranged marriage? Like we have to look at every single area of our lives to see where things are out of whack and to own them and not just be like, well, but I can't, you know, I hear this often. Well, oh, but I can't, we don't have enough money. We can't do this. where there's a will, there's a way I'm going to leave it at that. I don't want to get into details. Nobody's less fortunate or more fortunate. Each one of our souls is here on this planet right now in a situation that we're in. You can call it less fortunate or more, or, or, or more fortunate or whatnot. I, I believe that's a cop out. I believe we each have what we have. And now we get to step up. Now we get to create what we want to create. And yes, you could say there's some people around the world, there's some children that are in situations they can't just get out of. Sure. I still believe that every soul is exactly where it needs to be to get the growth that it came here to get. That's just my belief. You don't have to go along with that. That's a long rant. Thank you for still listening, if you're still listening. <laughs> um, but really, what it comes down to is very simple. Trauma is part of our operating system. Maybe it's not part of our operating system. Let me say it this way. Trauma is part of the system of growing as a human or as a soul on this planet, right? In this universe. So we can't trauma proof. We can't avoid trauma. Trauma happens. What we can do is to work to process and heal those traumas. 
And as a parent, we go first. Your child is not the problem. Your child is not a problem. Your child is not broken. Your child is actually here, like a check engine light in a car, to point out that we need to open the hood, look underneath, and see what's not working. And that hood is the parent or the parents. And when we as parents, we open the hood, and we look underneath, and we see what's not working, if we're honest about it, if we're honest about what's not working, right? Are we numbing out? Are we on pharmaceuticals? Are we taking drugs? Are we drinking? Are we overworking? Are we cheating? Are we pretending? Are we people pleasing? Are we fitting in with the Joneses? Are we religious because we should be, right? All those things have to be looked at. All that's under the hood. Our children aren't going to, you know, they're not old enough to say, oh, mom and dad, it's this. They can't point to a specific part under the hood. But that's not the check engine light's job, is it? The check engine light says something's wrong here, right? And, you know, nowadays we have more sophisticated computers in the car. So, yes, they do point out, you know, so that metaphor eventually is going to fall away. But you get the idea. Your child is here to say to you, even if they're not using words, mom, dad, something's off. My nervous system feels stressed. I, I don't feel safe. I, I, I can't be in this present moment and pay attention because I'm worried. I feel unsafe. I, I'm checking out, right? They, they're not using those words. It's funny, uh, not funny, but I think it's a great metaphor. Gabor Mate, when I was talking to him at some point, I had a couple interviews, I was blessed to do, and we were talking about children acting out. And he said, well, children act out. He says, it's kind of like charades. They're not old enough to say, you know, what's wrong. So they act out. And if you think of it that way, an ADHD child acts out. That's why teachers and parents are like, oh my God, what's wrong with this person, right? But if we could look at it differently, if we could look at it differently and say, what are they trying to tell us? They're acting out. So something's off. Let's, um, you know, process of elimination. That's what we did it with, with our son, you know? You got to look at food color. You got to look at diet. You got to look at exercise. You got to look at screen time. You got to look at the, the, the marriage, the parenting, the, the environment, the school, right? All of it has to be looked at, literally. Because if we don't do that, we rob ourselves of the opportunity to embrace this gift we're given that can actually transform us to step up and grow, to expand, to evolve as human beings, to rise from the ashes. That's a gift. To have trauma in our lives is a gift. You know, like recently I've been through so many dark tunnels in my life, even just in the last year, that I now look back and I go, what gifts that I'd been so like, I'm so grateful to have received the gifts that I've received. And my, you know, processing and healing of, of some of those events isn't over. But I can now look back and go, wow, I needed that in my life. That had to happen. I had to be brought to my knees in order for me to see the old patterns, in order for me to see the unprocessed, unhealed wounds and to start working on it. And I do hope that if you've been listening to this episode, that you identify with it, that you've heard something that you can take into your life, that you can take full responsibility for your own life and also for the fact that you have a child that is quote unquote acting out or that is behaving in a certain way that we label as ADHD. I hope you can take full responsibility for that and say, hey, this is my child. It's the human being I created with my partner and here's my child and they're in my life and now I get to go to work. I get to go first. I get to, in other words, it's almost like you get to scrub clean the entire environment that your family is, starting with you and your partnership, and your home, and your community, and your school, right? All of that, you get to 
flip it all upside down and see, is it actually empowering? Is it actually as calming for my child's nervous system as it can be? Or am I adding more stress? Am I the type of parent who's like, you have to go to Stanford or MIT by the time by the time you're this old and you have to, and if you don't get all A's and you get, don't get into this school, then you're screwed. Like, is that adding stress or is that actually calming? No, oh, it's a clear answer. But, you know, if you just shrug it off and go like, well, yeah, but well, my, child, I have, my child has to turn out, has to go good education, all that, you're, you're missing the whole point. You're missing the point because I believe, and I've seen it with our son, who's now in high school, that when the pressure is off and that stress is removed, they actually do better at school because they turn to the things they love and they embrace it. And the things they don't love but they have to do, they'll do it. They may not get straight A's. They may get B's in certain subjects. But our son is actually close to an A student. And he was supposed to be a failure, especially if not medicated, which he's not. He was supposed to have never made it into a good high school and not be productive and not get good grades and be basically a failure. That's not what's happening. I'm here to say that is not what's happening. But we also turned down, way turned down, any kind of expectation or stress, what he should be doing. And we've allowed him, as much as we can, to choose what he wants to be doing. And so why am I mentioning that? Because as parents, we are guides. We are not forcers or enforcers or dictators or authorities to our children. If we are that, if we're being that way, it's going to backfire. It's going to backfire. It will. And I just want to say thank you for listening. In the end, look, if you've listened this far, you're obviously a, a very aware human being, a parent or a human being, an adult. You know, if you don't have children with ADHD, but you came here for yourself or just listening in, you're somebody who's willing to dive deeper. You're somebody who's willing to go into the fabric of it all, not to stay on the surface. It's easy to stay on the surface. I mean, look how often we stay on the first page of the Google search results. That's, that's called the surface. Even three pages is still surface. Even four, five, six sometimes is still the surface, right? We do that because it's easy. We don't have time. We're so busy. Remember, busyness. We're so distracted by the rat race that we just don't have time to actually dig deeper and go down into the fabric and see what, how has this been constructed and when and why and do I actually, does it actually benefit me and my family or me and my child. And when we start asking the tough questions, such as, hmm, I wonder why there's an overlap between trauma and ADHD that is almost pretty much uncanny. Those are the symptoms of ADHD and how come trauma is in there? Well, let's look deeper. I've done that now for seven years. And I'm here to say there are very clear patterns. And I'm inviting you to engage yourself in the process of processing and healing your own traumas, to start feeling the feelings, to stop running from your own feelings, because the salvation is in releasing those feelings, not running from them. At some point in our lives, we're all going to stop running. The question is, when do you want to stop running? For how long are you going to still continue to run away from yourself, from your unreleased, from the suppressed feelings. I know I'm done running. I'm, I'm done running. And by no means am I done like baked and healed. No way. That's a lifelong process. But at least I've stopped running. And it's a lot of work. It's the work. There's a great song, by the way, by Rob Ricardo called The Work. I invite you to listen to it. The work is the real deal. Busyness is a distraction from the real work. Most parents that have a child with ADHD, this is sort of just a, another pattern that I've observed, are so busy in life, so in the workaholism or in just busy, 
distraction mode. That it is no wonder that that environment shaped their child's brain to be of what we call ADHD behavior. It is related. It is not a coincidence. I've rarely seen families that are very calm, very proactive in processing and healing their own traumas, very much, you know, in their passion in terms of work, not in the rat race. I've rarely seen families like that that have children with ADHD. Now, again, don't let this land as a blame. This is not, I'm not blaming parents. This is, there's a difference between being responsible as a parent to say, yeah, you know what? Our environment is not that calm, not that supportive, very stressful, very demanding, right? If we can own that, then we start taking responsibility. We start to say, look, it's not my fault, but I'm responsible and I'm going to go first. I'm going to do anything in my power first before I medicate my child, before I give my child these powerful drugs that alter their brain chemistry. Before I do that, I owe it to my child by using a process of elimination to really dig in and do the hard work of processing and healing our own traumas, of transforming all the areas of our lives that affect our family, right, and our environment. Do that first. That's my invitation. Do that first. You know, I just got a, an email the other day from a, a, a listener who reached out a couple years ago uh, and shared her love for the podcast and, and that it really inspired the family to, to, to do more. And I just got another email, and I'm so grateful uh, for listeners who reach out because it's feedback, right? It's not just me talking out into the ether. I mean, I know we have close to 2,000 listeners a week from all over the world, but hey, it's good to get feedback. And we get a lot of feedback, but when it's precise feedback, when someone shares how this podcast or these episodes have made a difference for them to actually start doing the healing work and no longer medicate or to not choose to medicate and first do the healing work, I mean, my heart jumps with joy. So thank you. If you're that person, if you're that kind of listener, I appreciate you giving your time so generously. You know, I always say your attention is your most valuable commodity and you have given it to me generously. If you've been listening to this episode or any of the other episodes, or if you've just come to check out the podcast, I really appreciate you. So today in this very moment, the way we do not disassociate is by being embodied in our body, right? By being here in the moment, not by wanting to escape, by wanting to numb out, check out, disassociate, right? Having a coping mechanism, an addiction. All those things are distracting us simply from feeling our feelings. And that's the real work. That's all these children want. They come here. They're like, mom and dad, feel your feelings. Process them. Heal it so I can, please. Let's co-regulate our nervous systems. Let's rewire our brains. Let's change our world. Let's all be more peaceful. See what I did there? Peaceful. Let's be more peaceful so then there's peace in the world. But if we can't be peaceful around our own families with our feelings, because if we're irritated, if we're in resentment, if we're stuck in the fear, that's not peace. We can rally all we want with signs out in the street. World peace, world peace, world peace. Yeah, well, you know, if uh, your home's a mess, you're stressed, you're at a career that you hate, you're in a relationship that doesn't work anymore, and you parent your children from old, antiquated parenting techniques, you know, there's no peace. There's no peace. Like Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. That's the message of today. Be here now. Do the work. And I'm speaking to myself every moment. Roman, be here now. Keep doing the work and things will be fine. Hey, thank you for listening. If you feel that this made a difference, please share it with someone in your family, with a friend. Send it to someone. Make a difference. I believe it can. And... We hope to have you back soon. Have a magical day. Cheers.